All right, let's go. We invited one of Scientific American Office's best cube solvers, Ryan Mandelbaum, to come take on Ian Scheffler, author of the new book, Cracking the Cube, Going Slow to Go Fast, and Other Unexpected Turns in the World of Competitive Rubik's Cube Solving. Oh. What makes this unique as a competitive endeavor is the way it combines your logical sense and your dexterity. Um, the, ironically, the faster you go, the slower it feels. Welcome to Scientific American, Ian. Thank you for having me. So this is me trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. So I start, and already, I probably like made three turns. I couldn't, I couldn't fix this for you. When I got these over, but I lost those. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, I'm done. Yeah, well, that's a place a lot of people start, is just sort of like trying to line up the colors. I mean, that's initially where I started. You don't actually have to know things like group theory, which is the branch of mathematics that most closely pertains to Rubik's Cube to learn to solve it, but if you want to try to develop a method for solving it, it is essentially a group theory problem. In the book I talk about, say, some of the basic elements of group theory which apply to this, like commutators and conjugates, which is, uh, takes the mathematical form A, B, A prime, which is just a, an operation, another operation, and the inverse of the first operation, which that's like opening the fridge and getting a sandwich out, because you have the setup operation, you open the door, and you get your sandwich out, and then you reverse the setup operation, and you haven't destroyed the fridge. Like, that's sort of the goal here, because oftentimes you will solve a chunk of the cube, and you want to preserve that, but you also have other stuff to solve. Okay, so these trailblazers use group theory and complicated math. How does it work in practice? How do I turn this complete chaos into order? Okay, so like you were saying earlier, most people make the basic mistake of trying to solve the colors, right? even though it seems very useful. So you see I've got the orange side lined up here, right? Now, every other side needs to be lined up. What I do, and what many cubers do, is to solve the cube one layer at a time. There's, you solve the bottom two layers and then the top layer as if you were building a layer cake. And so the first two layers of the puzzle is almost like a jazz solo if I was gonna be poetic about it because it is different every time. And so what I have are different algorithms, different tricks, and that's really where the highest art of cubing comes in is when, like a chess grandmaster, you can look ahead enough steps to make it easier for yourself later on. Um, so the last layer is the most complicated in the sense that it's purely algorithmic. There is nothing freeform about this. There's actually a limited number of cases that you can face. And if you document all these cases, you can then devise an algorithm, and there's many different possibilities for each case. So I'm going to orient the, uh, the last layer right now. So, so you have to memorize all of these cases and what to do in each situation. Yes. It worked out very nicely this time in that there's only three pieces left. Hmm. There's this piece, this piece, and this piece, which need to cycle around in place. Um, and that's the algorithm I use, and there we go. Wow. <laughs> so here we are in competition setup. We've got our official clock here. Let's see what you got. Okay. my personal best average of five solves is now just under 18 and a half seconds. My best single solve is 16. Well, you've definitely inspired me to try my hand at Rubik's Cube solving again. Thank you so much for coming. Sub 20 seconds! There we go. For Scientific American, I'm Clara Moskowitz. <laughs> <laughs> Should we keep going?